Hey EMM, it's Mason here to tell you about an exciting new opportunity we are offering. In an effort to tangibly improve our organization's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, we created the Diversity and Inclusion Award that fourth-year medical students that identify as underrepresented in medicine and are applying to emergency medicine residencies are eligible to apply for starting today. We understand that the cost of applying to residency adds up, and we want to do what we can to ease that financial burden. We are extending three $200 awards to selected individuals following a blinded review of all applications. Applications will be accepted through the end of November, and winners will be announced mid-December. Check out our website at www.emergencymedicalminute.org backslash EDI dash award for all the details and to access the free application or click the link in our show notes. Thank you. All right. Welcome to On the Streets. I'm with you again. This is Jordan Orada, And with me today is neurosurgeon, neuro-oncologist, Eddie Svankin. Um, Tell me a little bit about where you came from, where you practice, and, and what some of your favorite stuff to do is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're coming from my adopted hometown of Denver, Colorado, my honorary hometown of Denver, Colorado. So I, I came here when I was uh, uh, almost four years old from the Soviet Union with my parents. And I grew up right here. I grew up in Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, I went to Green Mountain High School, home of the Rams, if there's any any listening. Uh, stayed, uh, stayed in Colorado for college, went to CU Boulder, went to med school here in Denver. That's where I met my wife. Uh, if anybody asked, she did graduate ahead of me in our med school class, um, but uh, she is very, very smart. She's now uh, an interventional pulmonologist with National Jewish. Uh, but uh, then I took uh, seven years to train as a neurosurgeon at Duke in North Carolina, and that's where I did my residency and where I did my fellowship. And uh, the intent in, in leaving my home, uh, which I love, is uh, kind of twofold. One, Duke is the biggest and best uh, brain tumor center in the United States, full stop. Uh, and that's where I wanted to train because um, my passion was caring for patients with brain tumors, and that's where I wanted to learn how to do it. And two was I, I wanted a, a, a different and new skill set to be able to bring back home to my community. So it was always understood and Im- implicitly agreed upon between myself and my wife that uh, we'd come home um, I mentioned I met her here in Denver. Uh, she's from Longmont. That's where she grew up. This is home for her, too. When we knew we wanted to raise our kids here, we wanted to uh, to have a relationship between our kids and their extended families uh, who have remained in Denver. And fundamentally, this is my home. These are my people, and I want to take care of them. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that uh, being a brain tumor-focused neurosurgeon was was probably uh, the best adaptation of my of my capabilities. What, what a good way to make everybody else listening and in the room feel really lame about themselves. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's no, no, no. So cool. Uh, no, no, just uh, trying to do my part, uh, help help people uh, in in my own small way. Small way, yeah. Well, so you said your your passion is brain tumors. That's mm-hmm. what got you into this. So let's we'll start talking about that, and I think we'll probably revisit with you about some neurotrauma stuff another day. But um, as a paramedic, we see lots of patients who have vague symptoms, who have stroke like symptoms, who have a known history of brain tumors, who have a known history of cancer who are getting complex care and all of these patients ultimately belong to you and touch your practice. But before that, they see us and they're having some emergency. Um, What are some of the common things that you see coming to your practice from EMS that either have gone really well Mm -hmm. or have gone really poorly? Uh, so uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, I think the, um, the easiest place to get into trouble is, uh, with a patient that's in status out on the street, right? Uh, we're, we're out on the street. Uh, that's the name of the podcast. What? Uh, or... <laughs> what? <laughs> so out, out on the street, um, when I, when I think about, uh, really emergent things that affect patients with brain tumors, I think the number one is probably going to be, uh, new onset neuro deficits, uh, and seizures, but not necessarily in that order, right? So, uh, anytime somebody has a new onset neuro deficit, a facial droop, weakness, numbness, whatever it is, uh, of course, the first thing that, uh, that anybody that encounters them is going to think about is, uh, potentially a stroke. I think, um, 
We have a number of stroke centers locally and regionally, and we are really, really well adapted toward taking really fast and effective care of patients with strokes. And in fact, our, our uh, techniques and capacities for doing so have really evolved exponentially over the last 10 years or so. And so the first thing that you'll recognize is you don't, you don't have a CT scanner out in the field. You don't have an MRI in the field. You have no idea what's going on inside of that closed vault that's the head. And so your first thought is going to be this patient's having a stroke. Um, and I think that's appropriate because the vast majority of those patients with new onset neurodeficits are in fact having strokes. Brain tumors are not all that common. And, and what's going to harm this patient the most, the fastest, right? Exactly. A bleed or a clot. Exactly. And if it is a tumor... We've got some time to sort that out, right? Exactly. Uh, so that that's going to get sorted out at the level of the ED when they get their initial neuroimaging. Uh, and that's that's going to be part of the initial stroke workup. But the other thing that uh, these patients do present with, uh, and this is true for patients with high-grade gliomas, low-grade gliomas, uh, more commonly than high-grade gliomas, and certainly metastases, which are 10 to 20 times more common than either one of those, is seizures. Uh, and so it's important to be able to provide and stabilize these patients that are having seizures or are in status, uh, and then get them to the hospital so that uh, so they can get they can get the care they need. Yeah, we absolutely see a lot of seizures. We see a lot of complex seizures, a lot of primary seizures, a lot of withdrawal seizures. Um, yeah. What kinds of differentiating tools or or assessment tools are there that you would recommend to help figure out? what type of seizure a person is having, and, and does it even matter in the acute term? Yeah, from a brain tumor standpoint, it does, and I guess we can talk about just general seizure management um, or, or management of uh, status in the field, but there's no easy way, uh, certainly no unambiguous way, uh, to know if somebody has a brain tumor in the field, period. You, you need the neuroimaging, and that's uh, maybe that's um, just an intrinsic deficiency of you being uh, in the room with, with a neurosurgeon. We're an intrinsically imaging-dependent field, and how we plan our surgeries and how... Uh, and how we think about patients in general is is uniquely imaging dependent. In fact, I, I noticed this when I was training, uh, and I've I've seen myself evolve in this respect. Uh, when I think about patients, or when I remember patients, yes, there's a, a little part of my brain. Uh, for those of you taking notes, it's actually going to be the fusiform gyres uh, that uh, that remembers faces and remembers my patients' faces. But actually, and I would actually even guess that it may be even the same part of my brain. Whenever I think about a patient before I even think about their face or their partner's face, uh, I actually imagine their brain MRI. Uh, and whenever you mention a patient's name to me, whenever you cue that patient's name in my own mind, the first thing that I think of is actually, uh, if I've operated on them, maybe a, a short snippet of memory memory from, from the way their case went, but uh, more frequently, it's what did their MRI look like? And I, if you show me someone's MRI, I will immediately remember their face. I'll remember, uh, I'll remember their family. I'll remember meeting them. I'll remember their surgery. That's uh, intensely um, cueing and vivid, uh, vivid way for me to recall who somebody is. It's, it's through their imaging. That is uh, so fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can't read <laughs> any of the imaging. I try to look at them and understand them and it certainly isn't going to correlate to a human being. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Wow. Uh, from the standpoint of um, from the standpoint of somebody that uh, perhaps is, uh, has a neurosurgical history, I think that's also important. Um, just to just to get back to um, just to get back to the initial question, that was a little bit of a of a of an aside. Um, Almost invariably, they're going to have people that care about them around them, right? There are people that are available uh, for at least a brief medical history because, in general, patients that are experiencing a seizure, unless it's a, a simple seizure, uh, are, are not going to be conscious enough to be able to provide you with a history. And so I've had brain surgery. It's, it was two weeks ago. It was one day ago. It was five years ago. can provide uh, actually quite a bit of insight for me in terms of the process that's going on. So if... Actually, uh, this is true. I'm probably the closest thing I am aware of to a concierge neurosurgeon and that all my patients get a 24-7 on-call tumor line, meaning that there is a number that any of my patients can call if they're having a seizure at 2 o'clock in the morning or if they have a new neurodeficit or if they, uh, if they have questions or new concerns and they don't know who else to call or what else to do. They can reach me immediately, and that's the whole point: is uh, is to eliminate the fear and uncertainty associated with. I know that there is an abnormality in my brain. It's been treated in this way in the past, or maybe it's pending treatment because I haven't gotten surgery yet. I just met Doctor Eddie two weeks ago, and now I don't know what to do. There's there's a resource for them, and so uh, one of the most important things is: well, how long ago? 
were you diagnosed? What kind of treatment have you had so far? So if it's a patient that's, uh, that's having a seizure that uh, was operated on in the last 6 to 24 hours, the, the thing that I worry about the most right off the bat is a hemorrhagic complication associated with their surgery, whether it was a laser ablation that I had done, uh, which is minimally invasive, or even a biopsy, which is which is quite non-invasive, uh, to uh, a, you know a 10 or a 13-hour surgery, I worry um, – I worry always for the first six to twelve hours, especially uh, about the possibility of a, of a hematoma arising at the uh, at the postoperative cavity. And of course, in all cases, uh, hematomas, both in the trauma setting and the postoperative setting, are irritating to the surrounding brain, and that can precipitate seizures, even in patients that had not had any seizures previously. So that's the first thing I worry about. And of course, if they're having seizures or any other kind of new neuro deficit, that should prompt neuroimaging, uh, a CT scan, uh, to evaluate whether or not they're having a hematoma. And then in patients that, uh, in particular, were treated long ago to jump to the end or the end of the spectrum, maybe they had a low-grade glioma and they, uh, they um, had surgery, maybe they didn't even need radiation or chemotherapy postoperatively, and we're just watching them with MRIs. If they have a nuance at seizures, that, again, cues to me that, uh, sure, let's get a CT scan, but what I'm really looking at is an MRI, because is there something that is changing? Was there a transformation event within that tumor that somebody with a low-grade glioma now has a high-grade glioma, because the transformation rate is roughly 50% every 10 years, with some variation depending on the specific pathology that's, uh, that's at work. Is there something about the tumor? Is there something about their anatomy that's changing that now warrants a reevaluation? And that's what I'm worried about. And then there's all those patients in between. Uh, of course, after, after surgery or after chemotherapy, after radiation. So it, we think about surgery as a relatively invasive thing, but actually so is radiation. And the way that I talk to my patients um, in fact, I had this conversation with somebody, uh, like in the last two hours, if you have a high grade glioma that is by definition an infiltrative and invasive process, meaning that we can see, yes, a, a well delineated tumor on your MRI. And then, uh, a lot of neurosurgeons like to pretend that, yeah, this is the border of the tumor. I'm going to go around the border of the tumor and take it all out. Then we walk into the room and pat ourselves on the back. Like, Hey, uh, yeah, I, I, I got a gross total resection. And what I, teach my my residents, my fellows, uh, and my medical students is that the concept of a gross total resection for patients with gliomas, low or high grade, is really a lie we tell ourselves to make us feel good about what we do. We know that the border of that tumor is defined by nothing. There's an infiltrative edge in which we decide, either by radiographic parameters or, or based on what we see under the operating microscope, that this is where the tumor stops. But it doesn't. It sends little parts of itself out beyond the borders that we can see or perceive and into normal brain. And that's, and when I say normal brain, I really do mean it. That's functional brain. There's no brain in your head that's doing nothing. So there's brain that is being infiltrated by tumor that by necessity we can't resect. Uh, that brain is doing something. It's allowing you to talk. It's allowing you to move or allowing you to do something maybe even a little bit less descript that does endow you with some element of your quality of life. That's your empathy. That's your personality. That's your executive function. Cut that uh, out. Get rid of it, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so wait, so, you're telling me that there is not, 10% of my brain being used and the other 90% is just sitting vacant. Uh, all well, right. This I, is, yeah, this, this, this is a little, probably. this is a little bit awkward. Jordan in you. Yes, there is. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. For confirming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's, I, I have no idea where, where that, uh, misconception arose that just like 90% of our brain is just like hanging out. Uh, it, it, it may be, uh, I wonder if it, um, uh, it may be a relic of uh, maybe the proportion of, of neurons to glia. So uh, uh, the, the part of our brain that's, that's biologically responsible for the thinking process, at least we think that, that this is the case. And certainly this is the, the, the cellular constituents of our brain that are responsible for the electrochemical process associated with thought are the neurons. And then there's you know, a bulk of tissue that's, that's providing a more supportive and nourishing role called the glia. Uh, I am... Um, I have no idea where that 10% came from. The glia is not doing the thinking, but they, they, I mean, without the glia, the neurons couldn't do their job and think, so. And that uh, is to say, uh, as you're resecting things, yeah. you're not comfortable taking any extra healthy brain tissue if you... So, it, to tell you the truth, it kind of depends. And so, uh, this is where we get into, I, I'm not even sure how we got down this particular branch point of, of what I do, but... 
when I'm doing a resection. So I'm, I'm very fond of saying any idiot can take out a brain tumor. And I really do mean that. Like, so you go in there, uh, it's it's very clear, uh, at least where the center of the tumor is. Does Frequently, it the look tumor look differently. Is, like yes, if you showed me a patient open brain right if now, if you if you walked into my OR this yeah. afternoon, uh, and we we resected a brain tumor together, it would be very clear to you, at least uh, within the middle of the tumor, that this tissue does not belong. Like this over here is normal pink, healthy brain. And actually, many neurosurgeons will tell you uh, they all had this very um, clarifying moment where they saw a brain for the first time and that's when they decided to be a neurosurgeon and of course I had that moment too. The brain is is uh, shockingly beautiful um, but when I describe it to people it doesn't actually sound all that beautiful like I, I it's like pink and it kind of pulsates and it's like the, the the consistency of flan but uh, like the, the words really don't do it justice you just have to go in and uh, you have to look at it and you 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 see that this is an organ that is profoundly different from the other organs like it's very clear when you look at a heart and, all right well th this is a pump and of course a cardiothoracic surgeon will tell you that that pump is beautiful and they're right in their own way and then you look at a kidney and like if you I, I don't know what kidneys do uh, nephro if there's any nephrologist or buddy nephrologist listening I'm so sorry uh, it's my understanding we have between one and three kidneys they make urine uh, it, but they they have like this very clear uh, mechanochemical way of doing the thing that they do but then you look at the brain and you know it's um, yes it is beautiful and I understand not everybody feels that way um, but it's not immediately clear by looking at the brain if you were an alien coming from another planet and uh, inspecting this this organ what it could possibly be responsible for in the human body uh, it's like this is an organ where the like the output of the kidneys is urine the output of the lungs is is uh, is blood oxygenation the output of the heart is getting that blood to the brain obviously but to other places too presumably and the the point of the brain is to generate what is most likely the greatest miracle in the universe which is human consciousness and it's it's entirely unclear to uh, both me and a lot of other people who are paid to study this exactly by what mechanism that arises. And so, uh, you know, we, we can talk about neurophysiology and we can talk about, uh, we can talk about what percentage of the brain is responsible for, for human thought or, you know, what part of the brain is responsible for very discrete and specific activities like language or motor function. But at the end of the day, it takes an entire brain to make a human or most of an entire brain to make a human. And uh, I think I would make the argument that you require at least most of your brain to remain you. And so getting back toward uh, decisions that I make during tumor resection, so there are, there are very clear areas uh, around the periphery of any given tumor that contain functional brain tissue. That brain tissue is doing something. It could be language, it could be motor function, or like I said earlier, it could be something a bit more nebulous, but it's doing something. Of course, in the periphery of a tumor, that brain tissue has also been infiltrated by tumor cells. It's easy to take out the tumor. The hard part is the margin, and that's where the action is. And it is where I can most acutely affect two things. One is survival. So there's a very clear relationship between how many tumor cells are evacuated from the head of a patient in a tumor, with a tumor, and their survival. The second is, how functional is that person at the end of the tumor resection? And I'm very clear about this when I talk about, uh, when I talk about the goals of surgery with a patient. My first goal is not to hurt them, because if I hurt them and if I really decrease their ability to function, not only am I detracting from the quality of the remaining life that they have, but I'm also detracting from their capacity to tolerate the chemo radiation that they may need subsequently to the surgery. So I can't hurt them. And what I say to them, and if, if uh, there's any patients of mine listening, you've heard me say this, if I have to leave a little bit of tumor behind to keep myself from hurting you, I will. On the other hand, there is brain that is redundant. And when I say that, what I mean is the brain can be thought of as a series of nodes that are interconnected. You have two hemispheres. There's a reason for that. And there are functions that are so widely disseminated among a number of nodes located in, a varies, uh, in, in uh, various lobes throughout the brain that taking out, for example, a minor node 
which is perhaps, let's, let's say hypothetically, in the right frontal lobe, will not dramatically impact that patient's function. So there's, there's something maybe that's going to be subtly different about their executive function, their perception of reward, their perception of risk, their perception of uh, being able to uh, do a task without, uh, without distraction. So very subtle things, but not something that, one, would greatly impact their quality of life, their ability to work, their ability to enjoy the things that bring their life meaning. But there's tumor in that. Well, that's a decision that, one, we have to talk about with the patient preoperatively, is that brain you would want to keep at the expense of me taking that out in addition to the tumor that's infiltrating it, because if I can take that out, then I've bought you some time with my surgery. All of us lose the game at one point or another. Like, I could walk outside right now and get hit by one of your very nice ambulances, uh, and that's how I go. Um, for most of my patients, it's the especially patients with either stage four cancer or malignant gliomas, high grade gliomas, they're probably going to die of the disease process that I'm treating. And some of them will die sooner than others. Uh, my job is to extend that, give them time, but also give them good time. So we need to make decisions intraoperatively at the edge of the tumor, the borders of the tumor, where the tumor is propagating about how much survival can I trade for how much function. That's what makes tumor surgery interesting, and that's what makes it a challenge. I can chop out a tumor, Jesus Christ, I can chop out the whole hemisphere of brain. We used to do that. So back in the uh, back in the 50s and 60s, when we discovered that like curing patients with gliomas is impossible with surgery, well, I mean, the dumb guy, the dumb guy answer to that is, well, I mean, we can do super total resections. I mean, uh, all right, fine. I tried taking out the tumor, the tumor came back, and the patient died. What if I take out, like, the tumor plus, like, two inches of brain around that tumor? So uh, extraordinarily morbid surgeries up until hemispherectomies, just chop out that entire hemisphere, have been attempted. Invariably, it comes back. In fact, I've accidentally done that with lab mice in my own research where uh, I've, I've done tiny little resections and tiny little brains. Um, invariably, those mice still die, and they still die of, of glioblastoma, which is the model that I was studying at the time. And so... Uh, at some point, you have to acknowledge that in the process of a brain tumor surgery, there's going to be a decision where we trade time for function. And that decision has to be made correctly 100% of the time. And that decision is a collaborative decision between myself and the patient uh, and based on their values. And you those conversations before surgery, knowing that it's going to be dynamic when you get in there, mm -hmm. Is there, does there tend to be a common thread that these patients say, yeah, take a little more brain or, hey, leave me more brain, leave a little tumor? How do they generally feel about that? Or is it all yeah. over the map depending on their status? Or well, Yeah, so all patients have kind of this common denominator um, that most of them are, are very, very clear about. Uh, and the common denominator is that uh, they, they don't, they want to be able to take care of themselves. And that's kind of um, the reason. The reason that's a common denominator, and the, the reason that we actually have this this concept in, in neurosurgery and neurology of eloquence. Uh, so when we talk about eloquent brain, this is brain that has a highly specific function that is not redundant. So when I talk about eloquent brain, I'm talking about motor function. So uh, I saw a patient earlier today with a tumor in their uh, in their motor cortex. That's a very eloquent area tumor. And the challenge of taking out that tumor is to be able to resect as much of that tumor as possible without dramatically compromising motor function. There is a specific part of your brain that is in charge of specifically moving the contralateral side of your body. If you take that out, it's not going to grow back. And your brain isn't plastic enough in a meaningful way to direct other parts of itself to take over that function. There's, there's some exceptions to that in very young children uh, because of, just because of the embryology of the way that's all, um, the, the spinal cord is innervated and uh, the way that neurons propagate from, from your brain out to the spinal cord in your limbs eventually is, is uh, that's, that's a, a much different topic for a much different time. But suffice it to say that nobody wants to leave the hospital entirely dependent on their family for care. They want independence. And I think that's, uh, that's a basic human want, is to be independent, to not have to rely on others for basic elements of caring for yourself. You want to be able to feed yourself. 
Uh, I actually, so I've, uh, of course, because I, I live in a two physician household, I've had very detailed discussions like that with my wife. And I remember I had like a very, very specific criterion for even like wanting to be alive. Like we, we talk about like goals of care and all that. So my, uh, I remember like we were, this was actually in med school. My wife and I, um, were going through this, uh, we're going through this, this training series on, uh, defining goals of care for our patients. And, and we thought it was a good opportunity to talk about our own goals of care. And I was like, Kristen, I want you to know that if I can't wipe my own ass, I don't want to be alive. Like, I think that's very standard, right? Like, yeah. Like, I don't want that to be someone else's problem. Exactly. And so, of course, immediately she looks at me and she's like, so um, if, if you break both of your arms, do you want me to? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and then she made like, so I'm making like the little motion of like somebody strangling somebody else. Like, uh, and, and we, uh, I just. pillow yeah, over the face. Yeah. I, she, she seemed pretty eager to execute it. So uh, I. Uh, anyway, you sleep I, on edge now a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I tend to be very careful about uh, about breaking my arms. I guess only one at a time. So, back from from resecting and from the margins, which is fascinating, all the way back to initial onset and and just identifying a tumor and seeing it in its most initial phase when someone is having a seizure. Yeah. When we're trying to treat these seizure patients, mm-hmm. typically we're throwing lots of benzos at them. We're mm-hmm. trying to slow down the activity. How does that type of care impact what you're going to do longer term if we determine, it, and I know that it can be really difficult if, if we're thinking that it's you know seizure versus stroke, kind of altered, absence seizure, something like that. Yeah. You don't want to go too hard because you still want to be able to assess these patients as accurately as you can yeah. from a neurologic standpoint, but you also don't want them to be injuring themselves yeah. and harming themselves. So how do you balance that? Yeah, yeah. I, so the, the short answer is uh, I don't really. And here's why. At the end of the day, there's a reason that we kind of have a hierarchy of medical care, right? There's a reason that uh, the the priorities for the folks that encounter these patients initially are A, B, Cs, right? Uh, so if, if I figure out that a patient has a brain tumor, but they died 10 minutes ago of status, uh, that doesn't help anybody. So you, at the end, you don't get to work. Uh, well, if, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, I don't get to work. I don't get to help that patient because that patient's already dead, right? So at the end of the day, yeah, we like whatever we need to do in order to preserve that patient's life and limb is just what we have to do. Period. Uh, and there there are dramatic consequences to allowing somebody to seize. So it's important to manage those seizures in the field. And if it means my neuro exam is compromised when I see them in the hospital, then so be it. That's the way it is. At least that patient's alive. They can live to fight another day. At some point, they're going to metabolize those benzos. They're going to excrete them. And then I'll get a chance to examine that patient. That's that's the, that's just the way it is. That's reality. In fact, I'm, I'm um, I'm currently caring for a patient for for whom literally I've uh, I've not had a chance to meet her, interact with her, talk to her. Um, the reason being that she presented with status because of uh, new newly diagnosed stage four cancer, and so the the indication for me taking out that tumor that she has, she has a single tumor, uh, is. Literally, it's a lesionectomy for epilepsy. Uh, she has refractory seizures. She's not going to get a chance to meet me until uh, until after I've operated on her. Uh, and all my conversations so far have been with her family. But importantly, there's an entire team prior to me that encountered her from the EMS providers that brought her to the hospital to the intensivists and the ED uh, personnel that met her in the ED made sure she had a stable airway, made sure that a neurologist was involved in her care, made sure to get her the appropriate imaging, appropriately titrated the anti-epileptic drugs that she's been getting, have had her on EEG so far. Like there's such a huge chain and ecosystem of appropriate and necessary actions that uh, allowed her to even get to the stage where we can talk about doing a brain tumor surgery on her. It's... um. It's a testament to uh, the scope and and also the expertise of all the people that she has encountered before me. Because if a lot of really critical decisions hadn't been made the way that they were made prior to now, she would have just died. She would have died in the field. And then, it, it, like, th- that's it. That's very final. Yeah. So it, you you treat it the way that you need to treat it. Absolutely. Uh, the standard of care is is Ativan, right? Uh, so whatever whatever benzo you're able to get to abort the seizure, particularly if it's a generalized tonoclonic seizure, that's fine. I actually do have an interesting story. Uh, so I remember I was an intern. Um, 
and this is this is of course uh, taking uh, taking place in the hospital. Uh, actually, two stories. <laughs> <laughs> so one was uh, it was before I was an intern. It was uh, I, I was doing some sort of like uh, you know pre intern training uh, that was put on by the the Congress of Neurological Surgeons or uh, or something. And so they they ran through all these like fun scenarios about you know patients that were decompensating in some way, so that you know when I'm called when I when I am one day an intern, I'll, I'll like run into the room knowing what to do. And I remember. It was like a group, uh, like a group testing paradigm, where it was me and uh, both of my both of my co residents, uh, who who we went through training together for seven years, and uh, it was a patient that uh, went into status. Like, so you walk in the room, and there's like a mannequin that looks all creepy with like its open mouth, but there's like a speaker in the middle of its mouth that like somebody else is on the other end of, and so. Uh, it, it, I, I don't remember how it was like made clear to us because like the mannequins weren't sophisticated enough to like start shaking or, or have any other like outward symptoms of seizure but it was made clear to us that that patient had gone into status and I remember like I, I don't remember how I read this or where I read this but I had like at some point read up on like the maximum dosing for Ativan and so uh my uh, like the first words out of my mouth when like the patient started seizing were I need eight milligrams of Ativan right now, <laughs> and, uh, and then <laughs> like the uh, like the proctor on the other end like the per- the person that was supposed to be like playing the patient was like uh you sure and I was like yes eight milligrams of Ativan IV right now uh, <laughs> so that patient got immediately slammed with eight milligrams of, and, and of course uh, that that patient immediately needed to be intubated. Uh, and uh, so that was neat. <laughs> but uh, uh, in in the hospital setting, we do refrain from from giving benzos because at the end of the day, when um, when I've finished operating on a patient and I am worried about neurodeficits that can arise from surgically reversible causes like hematomas, when a patient has a new neurodeficit, when they have a change in the level of consciousness, when they have any kind of change in their neuro exam, the first question that I'm going to have is, why is this happening? And is it something that I need to take the patient back to the OR for? And so of course, I'm like an intern patrolling around the, the halls of Duke University, and I get a phone call that one of uh, the chairman's post-operative patients had, had started having a seizure. And this was a simple partial seizure that I believe the patient had a, a low-grade glioma that had previously been resected. They had presented with a seizure as many patients with low grade gliomas do and so I walked uh, like I walked over to the room uh, and the patient was having it like absolutely the, the the patient was wide awake they had some uh, they had some limb jerking but uh, otherwise um, they were they were awake talking and the nurse is looking at me like uh, so so what would you want to do hey, so, hey, guy, what's up? <laughs> uh, so fortunately I'd gone through that training exercise and I knew that eight milligrams of Ativan was too much, Little much. yeah 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 <laughs> Um, but I, I, I did end up giving uh, giving that patient some Ativan, and uh, of course the seizure aborted. So uh, th- I wanted to call and update my chair that, that I had done such a good job. So I called. It was, it was Alan Friedman, who uh, is um, who I, I now consider a friend and certainly a mentor. Um, but at that time was the the terrifying chair of Duke Neurosurgery, uh, and so I. Um, at least to me. So I, I call him and I and I said, "Hello, sir. Uh, so uh, you know, Miss So and So started seizing, and uh, they called me. So I walked over, and he knew immediately, within like two seconds of uh, me starting to tell that story, where that story was going. So it, on the other line, uh, or uh, at, like on the other end of the line, as I'm telling the story, I, I hear, "No, no, 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 no." <laughs> <laughs> of course, my story ended with, so I gave her some Ativan, and he's like, no, 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 no. And, and that's how I learned not to give post-operative patients Ativan. Uh, so, and the whole point being that, yes, after she got Ativan, she got sleepy, and then you don't know if she's, like, hemorrhaging or seizing or, like, but in the field, Jesus Christ. I mean, like, you, you have to do what you have to do to preserve life and limb, and whatever downstream diagnosis and whatever downstream treatment is secondary to that patient just staying alive so that they're able to receive that treatment. I think that's... if. If there is a learning point uh, to to that discussion, it's this. Uh, that was a good question. That, that <laughs> took us a, a lot answer. of places. Yeah. Well, I think, and I think there's so much in there. There's a ton to unpack, and it makes me think of so many other things. And and one of them is you keep talking about the family members and the patients and how valuable they are, especially in the acute phase for someone who has something new onset and for someone who has something with a history that something is different. And we learn this as paramedics that you have to listen to your patient. You have to listen to your family. We are not experts in anything except problem solving in short fashion and figuring out where to take them. 
they know way more about their specialty neuro case than we do. Yeah. So ask those questions. Get the paperwork. Listen to where they've been and where they want to go because 100%. all those things are so important, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and really leaning on the family. If the patient is alone, find family. Dig through their wallet. Try to get a hold of someone while they're seizing because that could make a huge difference in their outcome and what's going on, right? 100%. And it, and it also will uh, will save me time on the other end, right? So in this like hypothetical scenario, you encounter somebody on the street or in their home or wherever it is where maybe you are around and you're able to you're able to talk to whoever it is that they're with, maybe it's their partner, maybe it's a relative. But then you end up taking that patient to the hospital, and that patient arrives at the hospital in in an EMS vehicle. They aren't necessarily accompanied by family. So that means you are my resource for their history. Uh, I won't necessarily be able to immediately talk to that family. Yeah, so And the 10 minutes we've been with them isn't a lot of history, right? It's not. Uh, <laughs> but it's the only insight I'm going to get, at yeah. least until I get a hold of family, until I know the patient is stable, and until I have at least a, a kernel that will grow into whatever their care plan is going to be downstream in the hospital. So it, yeah, that's um, information that gets handed off and absolutely does inform treatment decisions. Yeah. So then on the flip side, so post-care, you've done a surgery, you've removed something, we've done a little bit of chemotherapy, we get called out because something's different. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's not a seizure, maybe it's um, something at the site. You had to do a burr hole or you had to do a partial hemicrany. What kind of things do we need to be looking for, aware of, and really acutely concerned yeah. about when we're looking at the post-surgical site? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked because uh, we, we kind of went off on a few tangents um, after I talked about, well, here's what I worry about in the few hours after surgery to here's what I worry about years after surgery. Most people exist in the interval that I didn't talk about, which is after they get discharged from the hospital, usually in the in the weeks and months after surgery. And this is what I think about when patients call me in clinic, when I get called by EMS about my patients or other physicians about my patients. Of course, some of them go to rehab. Some of them, uh, some of them end up um, going home, uh, and they're cared for by their family members. So, uh, yes, in the in the weeks after surgery there are a few things that I worry about a lot. And in particular, a lot of these patients, stage four cancer, or glioblastoma, high-grade glioma patients that are getting chemotherapy and radiation, and in particular, patients with recurrent tumors that I've done surgery on before, or maybe somebody else has done surgery on before, and, uh, and I'm doing a secondary or tertiary or quaternary resection of a tumor, I worry about wound healing issues. And not just because I made an incision and I want it to heal nicely, but because one, these are frequently older people, right? So they, they don't have the same protoplasm as, uh, as a child does or an adolescent does in terms of wound healing in general. If they've had incisions before, that means uh, that perhaps they're at risk for, because of limited blood supply to the scalp, uh, that's been abrogated by prior surgeries, including my own, not heal the same way we do. And crucially, they have gotten chemotherapy, right? So what does chemotherapy target? It targets rapidly dividing cells. Those are necessary for wound healing. Uh, they've gotten radiation, which also degrades the scalp's ability to heal. So these are patients that are predisposed to have a variety of extrinsic factors limiting their ability to heal from surgery. So of course, uh, I worry about wound healing. And if I worry about wound healing, then I worry about what's under the wound, because whatever's under the wound that we can't see is healing in the same way as the, the rest of the incision. So of course, I worry about fevers. Sometimes the seizures are something that is, um, that we, I, I'm not sure why I keep coming back to seizures, but certainly seizures are evidence of irritated brain, just in general. If I, if I had to make a blanket statement about seizures, at least in the context of, of my own practice, it's irritated brains. And then I have to figure out, well, what's irritating it? Is it tumor coming back? Is it peritumoral edema? Is it, a, like I mentioned earlier, a hematoma, red blood cells, or just hemoglobin that's, that's irritating it, or hemosiderin irritating it? And then finally, uh, is it an infection? Of course, infections, which are quite inflammatory, can irritate brain. So anytime I hear about a patient having uh, new onset symptoms, even if they don't necessarily even have a fever or other signs of systemic inflammation, for reasons I'll get to in a second, I worry about, well, is there a post-operative infection? The reason that I worry, even in the absence of systemic signs and symptoms of infection, maybe they can't mount an appropriate immune response. Patients with glioblastoma are immunosuppressed. 
they are. They have an abrogated capacity to fight off infection. So uh, I, I think um, a significant percentage of the PCP pneumonias, which is something you usually see in AIDS patients, um, when I was training at Duke, were actually harbored by glioblastoma patients. It's The tumor is intrinsically immunosuppressive. Uh, that's a property of the tumor, not even necessarily a property of, uh, of the chemotherapy that they get. That's, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. And so they're predisposed to not only getting infections, but they're predisposed to not being as symptomatic as we'd like them to be from those infections. Uh, and the proxies that we use for gauging systemic inflammation may not be accurate in those patients. So of course I worry about wound infections. Uh, we do have a platform through our own practice, uh, the Colorado Brain and Spine Institute, where patients are able to, if they have any concerns on their own, even outside of notifying EMS, just all of us carry around these beautiful devices that take really good pictures and they can, they can simply text us pictures. Uh, this is what my incision looks like. And of course, a little bit of redness is normal for the first couple of weeks. That's that's a sign of good inflammation. That's a sign that the wound is healing. But you know the wound edge is falling apart. Purulence. Uh, there's uh, a wound that looks good, and uh, you kind of end up with a gestalt as a surgeon for a wound that looks good and is healing appropriately versus a wound that is not healing appropriately. And then. The last kind of area of patient that I'll allude to is between two and five weeks after surgery, kind of after the uh, the incision is healed, the patient's going to start chemoradiation. And chemoradiation, uh, I'll, I'll just use glioblastoma as an example of this, that's an intense six-week process. It's six weeks of irradiating a margin around where I resected, and that margin is comprised of healthy, functional neurologic tissue that happens to have an unfortunate proximity to tumor and be infiltrated by tumor. And the whole point is treating that tumor and also being uh, given a drug called Temidar, which also uh, is going to have anti-tumor properties. It's an alkylating agent. It's a chemotherapy. It's given as a pill. It's not an infusion. Um, but still, it's chemotherapy and radiation that is going to affect normal tissues, even uh, even though we don't want it to or, or we wish it would not. And so that's going to precipitate swelling. Any injured tissue is going to swell. So can that cause new neurodeficits? Absolutely. Can it cause seizures? Absolutely. So those are the things that we think about. And, and usually uh, that's the class of patient that's kind of easiest to treat. The deficits usually arise and are somewhat subtle and uh, it can be treated just with steroids or anti-inflammatories. Uh, so it's the class that causes at least the, the least amount of concern for me. And I would imagine most of these patients now, because we have all of these resources in so many services have gotten really great about the follow-up and how they can stay connected with those patients, giving them those 24-hour hotlines. Yeah. And a lot of these patients aren't calling 911 unless there's something even more acute. So I get someone who's got a change in mentation and has a nasty-looking wound on their head that's from a surgery three weeks ago. Yeah. How important is it that I know where that surgery was done and, if possible, go to the same place where that was done? Or is there altered mentation and acute, closest neuro-capable hospital the best answer in that situation? Yeah. So uh, there are two answers, and I wish there was a, a blanket statement that I could give for all of you, but I would say um, invariably the best person to treat a given patient is the person that already has a doctor-patient relationship with them. So I think all patients are entitled to being cared for by people that they trust, to people that uh, that they can trust their relationship with, uh, and that, that they already have an implicit arrangement with. So I, I have the privilege of uh, taking care of patients not just from Denver, but uh, patients from the adjoining states will, uh, will frequently travel to see me. And so if, if I have a concern about a patient's infection that lives, uh, or excuse me, a patient's wound that lives in Nebraska, yes, they can text me a picture of their, uh, of their incision. And that's one easy way for me personally to evaluate that incision. But at the end of the day, if they need to be seen by a healthcare provider, I'm not going to tell them to uh, get in the car and then drive for six hours to come and see me, right? That sounds uh, totally reasonable. <laughs> well, and it's not reasonable for me to ask the local EMS crew, like, hey, so I'm in Denver. Uh, you're in, I, I don't know, like Scott's Bluff or wherever. And then, so now, uh, yeah. Arrange uh, the flight, make it happen. Exactly. Right now. Exactly. So I think a reasonable first start is let's get you to somebody that can lay eyes and hands on you because if there's any concern at all about life and limb, 
you need to be taken care of by somebody that is just nearby. And then I'm usually very grateful for uh, either either other neurosurgeons that call me about my patients or just other healthcare providers that call me about my patients and, and express their concerns because that means they cared enough. Like they, they evaluated my patient, they laid their eyes on them, they laid their hands on them, uh, in some cases even got imaging, and they just called me like, hey, this is what I've done, this is my impression, what's the next step? And sometimes the next step is, listen, uh, if you don't mind transferring to Swedish, I'm happy to take care of them. And sometimes it's, thank you so much for taking care of my patient. Uh, I, I, I can't think of anything to add to that. Yeah, you. you, you've done great. <laughs> Continue this course and yeah. call me tomorrow. Yeah. So if, uh, if there's any concern about airway, if there's any concern about, uh, about sepsis, things that need to be treated and are treated in, in kind of universal ways, uh, then they need to go to the closest possible place. If you have time to sit back and think, uh, the best person to treat you is your neurosurgeon or your doctor in general. Yeah, when when allows, go to your doctor, right? Exactly. And and we always try to honor that as pre-hospital providers. When a patient says they are treated somewhere, they want to go somewhere. If it's reasonable and it makes sense, yeah, we try to honor that because I think we get that same thing. We want a trusting relationship between provider and patient, and it better go both ways. Yeah, and of course, recently there's the added complication of, uh, well, uh, uh, you know. Are there beds in any hospital within 500 miles of where we sit right now? Uh, which is a real concern, right? Yeah. So every time I've been on call at Swedish in the last uh, in the last at least few weeks, I've taken care of a patient from Texas. That's and just a reality. Do you, on a total aside, yeah? Do you see this getting better soon, or do you think that we're stuck in this position for? Six months, a year, two years, five years. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably not the right person to ask about that because I'm neither an infectious disease expert, critical care expert, or epidemiologist. Um, I, I don't see it. Um, I don't see it changing any time on the scale of weeks, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, so, how has your team been doing actually with the burnout factor and the issues and all the the capacity, all the things that are stressing out healthcare providers and driving people out of the industry? Since yeah. we're on the topic briefly. How are you uh, and your team doing? Uh, so I, I personally am doing well, but uh, I think that uh, when you ask about me and my team, um, I have to offer the caveat that my team and I function in uh, a really privileged area of medicine. So, and, and I, maybe I only know this because I have some insight into my wife's practice uh, with, with her being an interventional pulmonologist and, and her uh, even not having a lot of um, ICU responsibility, but having partners that do. So at the end of the day, the COVID epidemic started during my fellowship when my primary responsibility was caring for brain tumor patients. Uh, it has persisted into into the first year of my practice, um, and my primary responsibility is still taking care of brain tumor patients. So I am not the one in the ICU uh, having to reuse PPE. I'm not the one in the ICU that has 28 beds on one side, 28 beds on the other side, chronically understaffed, chronically overwhelmed, and hoping that the next patient that comes to the e that comes in through the ED is is not in need of a ventilator because I, I don't have another one to provide. And certainly, I have friends around the country that are on social media now asking, hey, does anybody know of an ICU bed available? Because I have a guy that needs care. I have a girl that needs care. I have somebody that needs care, and I'm out of resources and unable to provide it. So, I mean, that's moral injury. That's the definition of moral injury. We all signed up for this to help people. Um, I, when, I, when I said earlier that, like, I, I help people in my own small way. I really do mean that. Like my role within the scope of the COVID epidemic is um, in some ways, in some ways like kind of insignificant because I'm not the one on the front lines taking care of those patients, but some people are. So one of my, um, one of my mentors likes to liken neurosurgery to, this is a direct quote from him, uh, the top mast on a sinking ship. So uh, <laughs> it's, it, you know, I, um, it's, it's nice to be on the top mast in this perspective, uh, I suppose, but I also try to remain cognizant that, that I'm in a privileged position uh, from the standpoint of patient care. 
Of course, in the operating rooms, there's always too many patients. There's always too many cases. Uh, there's, um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the OR technicians, the OR nurses, all the nurses in the ICUs that take care of my post-op patients. That right now, there's a nursing shortage nationwide. So all of them are being asked to do more. All of them are being asked to do more with less. They have more patients. They have less time. They have more hours. Uh, I don't know if they're getting paid anymore to do to do more work. I hope they are. Uh, but it's, um, what was it? What was the line that Spock used? Um, when, uh, when like the enterprise was going down in the star Wars movie, like, uh, and he personally was suffering and I can't remember why, like, uh, the, one of the, one of the other characters like asked him, like, what do you, what do you need from me? Because it was clear that, uh, he was just holding back tears and he was like, I just need everybody to continue performing their duties admirably. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how it is. I think for a lot of my peers that, that are in the ICU that, that are taking care of COVID patients. Um, because I think they're being stretched much thinner certainly than I am. And of course, uh, you know, guys like me can complain like, Oh, they made me postpone my elective case. Um, and to a certain extent, that, that is a possibility down the line, but I'm very fortunate that at no time a brain tumor patient under my care has had their care affected by COVID. I think uh, both Swedish and Sky Ridge hospitals, the Sarah Canna Cancer Institute, certainly the Colorado Brain and Spine Institute, have all gone out of their way to ensure that my patients get timely care when they need it. So if that were not the case, maybe my answer would be different. <laughs> well, I appreciate your sensitivity to the whole continuum of care and everybody that's involved in all of these patients and that it's impacting some a lot more than others and being insulated from that is a blessing and um, some of our listeners are are more insulated than others but I think um, I think we're all dealing with it to some extent or another but I want to get back on to, to more neuro stuff because we saw a couple interesting cases come in recently and I it really made me wonder man there's a lot about this that I don't know and it's VP shunts oh yeah and, and so I did a little bit of reading, and it was like, man, I'm just going to ask Eddie, because he knows, <laughs> he definitely knows more than I do. And so we had two, and it was a, a strange coincidence, and, it, and that's really what made me wonder about mm -hmm. it, because we had two back-to-back -back EMS patients with VP shunt issues. And, and I thought, is it something to do with uh, weather? Is it something to do with barometric pressure? Does any of that affect this? And if not, what a weird coincidence. And, and what are the important things to know about VP shunts? And I guess for someone who doesn't know, what are they? Oh, man. So you're, you're about to get an unnecessarily long-winded answer. Uh, and it's going to start with a caveat. Uh, that's probably the defining attribute of this interview. All right. So first of all, I want it on record. I'm not a shuntologist. I'm not a shunt expert. All right. That's out of the way. Uh, but I do care for patients with hydrocephalus and ventricular perineal shunts. So um, I guess we'll start with this. Ventricular peritoneal shunts are a dumb solution to a problem we don't understand. And actually, I would say the same thing about tumor surgery. So, uh, <laughs> Like most medicine, really. That, it, uh, I, that's probably true for, for a lot of medicine, but it certainly is true for my chosen field. And I'm hopeful that by the end of my career, we no longer will need to offer surgery for patients with at least primary brain tumors. We'll, we'll set that aside. But VP shunts also are a dumb solution to a problem that we don't understand, but also a very necessary solution and certainly life-changing and life-saving for a number of patients. So uh, a ventricular peritoneal shunt is kind of exactly what it sounds like in that it shunts fluid, it diverts fluid from uh, the brain or uh, in, in, in some cases, so there's lumboperitoneal shunts, they, uh, they divert fluid from the lumbar cisterns, but they divert cerebrospinal fluid into some area. And yes, sometimes they go into the peritoneum, uh, so ventricular tracheal peritoneal. Uh, other times they go into the pleura when the peritoneum is not accessible for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then uh, uh, tertiarily they can go into the atrium of the heart and, and, and uh, uh, directly dump into the, uh, to the venous circulation. Uh, on very, very rare occasions, like case reportable occasions, uh, I believe you can also place a shunt into the gallbladder. I've never done that nor seen it done, but I, I hear that's a possibility. So the reason somebody might need a ventricular peritoneal shunt is for the indication of hydrocephalus. And so uh, hydrocephalus is a kind of an umbrella term, it literally means water on the brain. What it really means is for one of a variety of reasons, without getting into the different etiologies and, and uh, underlying diagnoses associated with hydrocephalus, is there's an imbalance between the rate of CSF production, cerebrospinal fluid production, and absorption in the brain. 
either because there's an obstruction somewhere uh, or because you are incapable of, of reabsorbing cerebrospinal fluid at the rate that you should be reabsorbing, or your rate of production and reabsorption is perfectly balanced and you simply have an anatomical problem or a ventricular compliance problem that necessitates that some cerebrospinal fluid occasionally be diverted to some place that isn't your head. Uh, the consequence of not being diverted, of course, being that uh, either the pressure escalates within your head, causing damage to the brain, or simply you can't sustain normal or slightly above normal pressures for, for long periods of time, and you have symptoms as a result, and you just need lower pressure inside of your head. The most, um, obvious, the most obvious disease state being normal pressure hydrocephalus, which by definition is ventriculomegaly on, on imaging and the setting of normal pressures and relief of symptoms, which are uh, usually urinary incontinence, gait imbalance, and dementia uh, through CSF diversion. So it's uh, literally a device that is comprised of really three segments. One segment is proximally inserted into a cerebrospinal fluid space, most commonly the ventricle through uh, any route. A valve, which functions on a pressure differential. So there is some pressure inside of the head. There's some pressure in in the case of a ventricular perineal shunt, in the belly, the abdomen. And based on the difference between those pressures, that valve, just like the valve in the heart, will uh, will either remain closed or pop open and, uh, and sh- literally shunt fluid out into the third part of the system, which is just the distal catheter, and that goes from the valve into, uh, into the perineum. The reason I say it's a stupid problem to us, uh, or a stupid solution to a problem that we don't quite understand is for kind of some of the physiologic reasons I alluded to earlier. So what is normal pressure hydrocephalus? Why is that a thing? Why can't some people tolerate even normal ranges of intracranial pressure? Or for that matter, why do we have ventricles? So I think I've made it pretty clear that I think the brain is awesome and important. Why are there spaces in your head that are being occupied by pockets of fluid as opposed to brain matter. Why is that necessary? Is it, uh, are they a heat sink? Are they uh, sinks for pressure gradients? Why is it necessary for your brain to generate 20 cc's, that's almost half a liter of fluid every day, and then reabsorb it so that it can flow all over the place like some sort of weird uh, like fish tank filter? So these are questions we don't have great answers to just as, as a specialty. And so the fact that we have to divert CSF under some pathologic circumstances um, really brings to light, like, why, why, why do we need to have this problem? Why did evolution see fit to endow us with this particular attribute uh, that predisposes us to this particular set of problems? But the most basic way that we understand it is as a plumbing problem. So if there's too much pressure inside the head, one easy way to divert pressure from outside of the head is just to siphon off some of the fluid, and that's easy. So we can, we can uh, introduce a, a shunt system to do that. They fail a lot. Any human-created device is going to fail a lot. So I, I learned at some point that the half-life of a ventricular peritoneal shunt is roughly two years. So uh, what that means is you implant a, a ventricular peritoneal shunt into a patient, and you can count on, well, how, let's figure out how old they are, how long we expect them to live. At half-life of two years, that's a decent number of... Um, of revision surgeries down the line. Of course, some patients are exceptions to that, and some some patients can go for years and even decades without a shunt problem at all. Uh, and of course, um, any neurosurgery resident will tell you that they've met you know certain very unfortunate patients where you put their name into the PAC system at the hospital, and then you have to actually start using date ranges in addition to their name because they've had so many CT scans and they've they've had uh, dozens uh, in in one patient who shall remain unnamed, uh, hundreds of revision surgeries over their lives. And that's, that's, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know, even have words for that. That's not right. Like that nobody like less to, than ideal. Yeah. Care. Like, we can do better. <laughs> well, that's the point. We, we really can't like, uh, like that's, that's kind of the problem. Like I wish things were different, but like at this point we really can't do better. It's not like they went through 150 unindicated surgeries, just their shunt failed 150 times and we haven't come up with a system that works better than what we have. Uh, and, and of course, uh, especially in developing countries, there are uh, there are alternatives to shunts under certain physiologic and pathologic circumstances, like choroid plexus cauter- cauterization. Uh, one of my mentors used to always say, if you see choroid plexus, 
sorry, for, for those of our listeners that don't know what choroid plexus is, it's the organ within the brain that actually generates an ultrafiltrate of blood that we call cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so if you see it, you cauterize it uh, so that you, you make a little bit less uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so yeah, there's choroid plexus cauterization. There's there's uh, other techniques that, for example, I, I like uh, one of my favorite surgeries is actually an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. We're using a little endoscope. I can poke a hole in the bottom of the third ventricle, and it's a very nice uh, solution to uh, obstructive hydrocephalus in certain locations. So uh, in certain cases, hydrocephalus can be treated in the absence of a shine. I think that answered your question. Yeah, and so... On that note, then how alarming should it be if someone's having an issue with that? Um, I mean, I'm sure it always depends on their presentation. If they're severely altered in the setting of VP shunt dysfunction, that should be alarming. But how rapidly can ICP get to a dangerous level with a malfunctioning VP shunt? This is one of the reasons I say that shunts are a, uh, a, a, a stupid solution to a problem we don't understand. Because everybody's different. So I, I, there are absolutely patients who decompensate rapidly from shunt failure, meaning they go from obstruction to obtunded in a matter of, uh, in a matter of minutes to hours. Other patients appear to tolerate uh, obstruction quite well. And it, part of it is, is sussing out what is the indication for you having your shunt placed. And that's a really important question for me when I see these patients in the ED or in the hospital. So for example... A patient with obstructive hydrocephalus, arachnoid webs or tumor that's occluding the cerebral aqueduct or something like that, and that's the indication for their shunt placement. If they're in the hospital, or maybe maybe I should back up, if their shunt is failing, that's a huge problem because they have no egress route for the CSF that they're generating. And so when I see them in the hospital, it's a a greater cause for alarm than, say, a patient who had a shunt placed for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Because that patient, if their shunt fails, will not die. If you have normal pressure hydrocephalus and your shunt doesn't work, you will not die from shunt failure. A patient with obstructive hydrocephalus or post-infectious or post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, true hydrocephalus, increased intracranial pressure, if that shunt is not revised or if another CSF diversion procedure is not done, that patient will die. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, I'm not saying their lives are going to be comfortable. Yes, they will certainly have a recrudescence of the symptoms that caused them to, to require a shunt in the first place, but they're going to live. And so these patients, like I'll see them in clinic, we have time to, to kind of mess with their shunt, work up their shunt. This is not a patient that needs to go emergently to the emergency department. So it kind of depends on what the etiology of hydrocephalus is, but it also, I don't know if it's reasonable for me to, to expect like EMS providers to be able to suss that out when they go to someone's home. I mean, what you see manifestly is, you know, Mr. Smith is not acting quite right. He has a shunt. Again, I can adjudicate, well, he's not acting quite right. He has normal pressure hydrocephalus. What you're seeing is probably a, a shunt malfunction, but it's not an emergency versus, you know, Johnny's not acting quite right. He actually has obstructive hydrocephalus. His shunt is failing. If something isn't done in the next few hours, he might die. So that, that's the two kinds of uh, extremes that at least I keep in the back of my mind. And that's always my first question uh, when, when I get called about a patient with hydrocephalus or shunted hydrocephalus is, what's the etiology of hydrocephalus? What's the underlying diagnosis? The diagnosis isn't the patient has a shunt. The diagnosis is what necessitated the, the placement of that shunt. And hydrocephalus is not a diagnosis. Is it obstructive hydrocephalus from a tumor? Is it uh, aqueductal stenosis? Is it uh, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus because they had subarachnoid hemorrhage three years ago? Is it normal pressure hydrocephalus uh, or, or something like that? So the diagnosis is important in how these patients are evaluated. Well, and I think that's true for, for any of these neuro patients that EMS is in encountering, right? That's and fair. That, that's probably some of the pearls from, from this conversation is, is figure out that history. Be a really good investigator in the field. Get that information. Find any paperwork on previous surgeries, operations, diagnoses so that we can better and more rapidly figure out what's going on with these patients and lean on the patients, lean on their family, figure out that history. Use whatever tools are at your disposal for that, right? I like that, yeah. Any other pearls that you would say? I, I, we could go on like this for hours, but I think <laughs> we're going to have to have a few sessions here, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like that. Uh, this is actually a ton of fun. Uh, this, Well, uh, 
I, I suspect anything where I get to talk about um, stuff that I like as much as I want is going to be fun. But uh, <laughs> we don't get to do one just on your daughter, okay? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, if we could do a session on my daughter and uh, Peter Forsberg, also, <laughs> uh, that would be ideal. Um, but uh, I, I, uh, I think we covered most of the high points, uh, certainly for VP shots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because that was really nagging at me for the last three weeks. I'm glad. Let me, uh, let me, um, actually, let me request a, a quick. Uh, intermission uh one because i'm getting thirsty and two because i need to call the yeah, or absolutely We'd like to thank our sponsor, Health One Continental Division, and Swedish Medical Center for their financial contributions to the EMM. Donations from them and listeners like you make it possible for us to fulfill our mission of producing and spreading free medical education to the masses. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a one-time or reoccurring donation to help cover our operational costs and keep the EMM awesome. Click on the link in our show notes to make a donation. Thank you for listening.